There are various symbols that are used to represent different types of words in engineering drawings. Um, we will th see through some examples. So basically, first we draw an arrow. We mark the well location. From there, we draw an arrow. And then on that arrow, we put various symbols. Some of the important symbols that are marked here are uh, of importance for us. So for example, a fillet weld is typically shown with a triangle. If it's a plug or a slot weld, it is typically shown with a uh, box sitting on that line. If it's a groove weld, depending on what type of groove it is, whether it's a square groove or if it's a, uh, a V groove or a bevel groove uh, and so on. So these symbols are, uh, symbols are shown. If it is a double square or double V or double bevel, that means both faces of the plates <coughs> are uh, machined to create the groove, then this uh, symbol is repeated on both sides of that line. Um, if a backing plate is used, again there is a box, but this box is drawn above the line. If a spacer is used, then that box is drawn in the middle of the line. If the weld is to be done all around, then a symbol, a circle is shown. If it is a uh, distinction between a weld which is to be um, uh, to be provided in the field or at a fabrication shop. So if it is a shop weld, then we don't put this flag, but this flag, if it is provided in the drawing, it means that this is to be done at field. In that uh, symbol where we mark the weld dimensions, the, the details have to be present in this order when we read from left to right. So the first, the size of the weld should be mentioned. So if it's a fillet weld, so size is basically uh, these two legs. If the two legs are of equal size, we will simply mention one number. If the two legs are of different sizes, we would mention A multiplied by B. Weld symbol. So first we will mention the number, which will be the weld size. Then to the right of it, we will mention the uh, symbol. So whether we will put a uh, fillet or we will put a square or we will put a V and so on. Then subsequent to that, we will mention the length. So if the length is not what the obvious length is, so if so some of the welds could be throughout the length of the member, then we don't have to mention the length. If that is not the case, we need to mention the length of the weld also. And then if it's an intermittent weld, then we mention the spacing. Then all the other symbols are also provided <coughs> uh, uh, on that same arrow. When we uh, mention fillet weld, we have to make sure that the vertical leg should be at the left. So here are some examples of fillet weld symbols pro uh, as provided in, a, in an engineering drawing. So let's try to read this sign. This is one plate, this seems to be another plate and then there is a fillet weld. There is a weld on this side and there is a weld on this side. How do we represent it? We represent it with an arrow like this. So this arrow points to the weld here. The number before, the first number that is written in that uh, arrow, on that arrow that number represents the size of the weld. So which basically means that this weld, a triangular weld, fillet weld, has a leg size of 8 millimeters, <coughs> followed by a triangle. Now, if you may remember, this triangle represents a fillet. Here we can see one triangle above the line and one triangle below the line. What does, what does that mean? It basically means that there is a fillet on this side and there is a fillet on this side. That means there are fillets on both sides of the same size, 8 millimeter. So that's what this symbol means. If it's a weld all around a tube, so basically what you see here is basically a plate and this tube, hollow tube is welded to this plate. So now in this case, we cannot weld it from inside, of course, because we don't have access to inside of the tube. So the weld is only on the outside. And because the weld is only on the outside, only this weld is present on this particular part. There is no weld present on this side. That means this uh, fillet symbol is provided only on only below the line. In addition to that, there is a small circle drawn right at this corner. That circle represents that this weld is to be provided all around this tube. Okay, to weld all around. In this particular case, what you may see here is that these two plates are being uh, lab joined, right? So in such a situation, you have you, you can see an arrow starts from here then it shows two fillets but the two fillets are not overlapping unlike here now they are staggered what does that mean that probably means that there are staggered welds 
Now, in addition to that, the size should be written here, but the size is not mentioned just to not uh, uh, distract us. Ideally, a, a size of the well should be mentioned. But after that, it is mentioned that it is a 50 hyphen 100. So, as we had seen, the first number on this on this side of the on the right of the weld symbol is the length of the weld, and the second number after that is the spacing of the subsequent welds. So, what does that mean? It means that these are intermittent welds of 50 millimeter length each and then subsequent to that uh, there is a spacing of 100 millimeters it basically means that it basically means that uh, there is a weld here then there is a gap of 50 millimeters then there is another weld here and so on so the weld length is 50 millimeters then there is a gap of 50 millimeters so essentially the center to center spacing becomes 100 millimeters okay. and then the on the other side of this plate if i'm looking at this thickness other side of the plate there there is a staggering so that is why there is a gap between this and this so which basically means that there, these welds are staggered they are not exactly opposite to each other. Also, let us do a few examples of groove welds. So, groove welds require many more details because there are uh, many more details during the welding as well. So, <coughs> as we had seen, a square symbol basically represents a square groove and this represents a bevel. Right. So, basically it means that on one side, on this side of the plate, we have a 45 degree bevel. Now, bevel as we know means that only one of the plates is to be uh, grooved, the other plate remains a square. Right. That is the symbol. The 45 degree angle here represents the angle of this bevel. And then on the other side, above the square sign, there is a number written 4. The 4 basically represents the root opening of the square groove. So, we need to prepare this groove in such a way so that there is a root opening of 4 millimeters in between on the back side and on the front we have a uh, 45 degree bevel. In addition to that and then that has to be welded together because this is a bevel weld and this is square weld. So, how do we do a square weld and a bevel weld? Of course, it automatically means that uh, we cannot do both welds simultaneously. So, we have to do this weld from the back side which is also uh, clear by the sign back gouging. Right? Back gouging basically means that first we will weld from this side, we will fill this gap, whatever small uh, com not fully unfused, uh, not fully fused metal is deposited on this side that we will remove through machining and then we will do another weld on the back side. So, that is that will be called a backing weld. This is a simple symbol. Now, here what you can see is that two squares are marked opposite to each other, which basically means that there has to be one square weld on the top and then another square weld. So, there is no groove, specialized groove to be cut. It is a square groove that is filled with welding material. In the third symbol, you can see a, a couple of details. First of all, it says this arrow has a V shape under it. So, V shape basically under it means that on this side of the plate, we have a V. Okay. On top of the arrow, we can see a, a rectangle drawn. That rectangle represents a backing plate. That means we need a backing plate behind this weld. In this weld, there was no backing plate mentioned. That means, that means there was no need of a backing plate, but back gouging was used still. Then there is a uh, number 10 basically here again represents the root opening. So, the root was 10 millimeter wide. Because the root was 10 millimeter wide, there was a possibility of the weld material to leak or to slip out from here. That is why they have provided a backing plate. In this particular case, the root opening was only 4 millimeters. And then this 30 degree again, right below 10, they have written 30 degree. 30 degrees represent the uh, angle of this V groove. You might also be familiar um, with the phenomenon wherein uh, the thermal strain, thermal uh, stresses that are introduced during the welding process um, can bring in uh, some defects and uh, 
some kind of a distress in a welded joint. So the uh, issues that uh, arise out of those thermal uh, process can be categorized into three broad categories, the development of cracks, distortions and residual stresses in welded members. So after a weld uh, is completed, the member can undergo some cracks or some kind of unwanted fissures can be created. Alternatively, <coughs> the member can deform in such a way in which it was not intended and uh, that is also because of the thermal strains that are introduced as a welding process. If both of these are prevented, still there is a very high likelihood of developing residual stresses in the built up sections or in the uh, joints where which are prepared using welded joints. So uh, as we might have uh, guessed, the primary reason for development of these uh, uh, distresses are is the uneven cooling of the uh, system. So when we use welding, we basically heat the system or heat the structure locally around that portion where we are depositing the welding material. So the metal, uh, the parent material also melts and also the molten uh, filler material is deposited in that area. However, as soon as the structure starts to cool down, that uh, neighboring areas start to cool down, the metal shrinks and sometimes that shrinking also involves, um, since the rest of the material is not uh, flexible, it is still at cool temperature, it offers much higher level of rigidity and if that uh, cooling happens rather suddenly, that can lead to some kind of fissures or some kind of um, cracks appearing in the welded connection that is basically that destroys the weld property weld quality so we need to be uh, we need to handle these situations very carefully there is a possibility of cracks appearing there can be two three different types of cracks which may appear so <clears throat> uh, there is one which is typically known as center line cracking which usually happens immediately after the welding is done there is also something called heat affected zone cracking which often happens because of some kind of a hydrogen ingress and it happens after a few hours after the welding is completed. It does not happen immediately after the welding is completed. And uh, if we can prevent the hydrogen from the atmosphere and mostly the source of hydrogen is uh, presence of moisture uh, in the electrode or in the areas surrounding this weld, that uh, moisture can uh, ionize and turn into hydrogen and that hydrogen can actually affect the quality of the weld especially the area near the weld. So they need to be <coughs> uh, we need to handle that carefully. Also if we are welding some hot roll sections often it is observed that uh, if in a hot roll section as a part of the process of hot rolling some internal uh, defects are introduced and these defects are usually parallel which basically create weak zones or weak interfaces between the layers of material and if we weld another uh, uh, provide a welded connection and the welded connection is provided in such a way so that it introduces a tension on those interfaces there is a high likelihood that there, there will be a failure which is typically classified as uh, lamellar tearing so lamellar tearing basically corresponds to the tearing of these interfaces which are introduced as a part of hot rolling process. So if we can uh, prevent this kind of a, uh, in order to prevent this kind of a tearing, either we should opt for a material which does not have this kind of weak zones or has minimal amount of those weak zones or we have to cut grooves in such a way so that the entire weld is not done to a single layer but it is done to several layers. So in this particular case the groove is only cut on this plate but if there was a possibility to cut a groove into this plate also that might have prevented this kind of a lamellar tearing. Um, not only cracking, there is another possibility of distortion. So even if the cracking does not happen, which is basically if this member is not fully restrained and this weld wants to shrink, there is also a possibility as it is shown here, this big plate is welded with a thin plate here and through two fillet welds. And when the welds start to cool down, they shrink and as a part of shrinking process, they can pull the big plate up introducing this kind of a distortion in the plate this kind of a distortion if it's a simple connection it is it can be tolerated even though there are stresses because of this but if it's a complicated structure this kind of a distortion can affect the fit at other locations and will introduce more and more stresses subsequently 
So here are several, several examples. In this case, only one sided belt is provided. And as a result, you can see some angular distortion appearing here. So all of these examples are angular distortions. There are other types of distortions also that you can read about from the textbook. If we are able to restrain these members in such a way so that they don't distort and also we are able to uh, make sure that this kind of cracks do not appear, appear in the welded area, still there is a possibility uh, that the members will develop a significant of amount of residual stresses and those stresses will again anyway reduce or affect the design strength of the member. So we need to be very mindful of these residual stresses also. So residual stresses can be handled to some extent using design equations by changing the capacity of the member somewhat. However, the other types of uh, situations, especially where we have very large distortions or with, where there is a possibility of a crack appearing in the welded zone, those things have to be prevented and some precautions have to be taken. So generally, the reason for developing a shrinkage crack or a uh, excessive distortion is basically a poor heat management. So we should take care of First of all, if we do a heat treatment, meaning that we uh, heat a larger portion of the uh, of the structure and then we make it cool down slowly after the welding. If we can do that, that can more or less uh, um, resolve the issue of development of cracks due to uh, welding. And also we need to make sure that there is no moisture present in the atmosphere near the weld or, or the the material that we are using for the welding it is not uh, it does not have much of a moisture that can also prevent um, the heat affected zone type of cracking which actually happens in the parent material but because of the hydrogen ingress we should also make sure that we don't over weld so if the design weld requirement is let's say six millimeters we don't have to provide it a 15 millimeter or 12 millimeter weld there you know so it is uh, we should provide only as much weld as required because over welding means more and more residual stresses or more and more shrinkage stresses being introduced and they can lead to excessive <coughs> deformations distortions or uh, excessive cracking we should also try to minimize the number of passes so what do i mean by passes weld passes so for example if this weld is let's say 12 mm 12 mm thick but I would want, I don't want to use a electrode which can do a 12, 12 mm weld in a single pass. I may also have an option of going with a, with a, a smaller electrode and do it more than one pass. So maybe I can go with a uh, 6 millimeter weld at once and then the second pass can allow me to do another 6 millimeter thickness of this. So that is perfectly okay to do. However, we should try not to overdo it, meaning that we should not go for too many passes. So we should try to optimize the weld size, the, the electrode size in such a way so that we can accomplish this task with the minimum possible number of passes. Because every time we uh, do one weld pass, basically we heat the system again and we cool it down again and we introduce new thermal stresses in the structure. Also, if the filler material is of higher strength, it usually has lower uh, ductility that means that it can crack easily so typically it is recommended to go for the material that is of the lowest strength that would that would give us the required design capacity so as if we are able to use a lower strength material but i am able to get the required design capacity there is no use it's rather avoidable to go for a higher strength material because that would be uh, more likely to crack and we should not over reinforce as mentioned before we should not try to uh, use excessive amount of weld and also this portion that convex portion of this weld is called the reinforcement uh, reinforcement so without that we could have also made it flat but generally to make it uh, safer we make it slightly re uh, reinforced slightly uh, we make it bulge outward but we should not overdo it because that can also lead to excessive uh, thermal stresses in order to prevent distortions all the methods that were discussed before are all relevant they should be they should also help with the distortion however in addition to that uh, another technique that can be <coughs> employed in such a situation is called it using intermittent weld so for example i have this plate and i want to weld this plate this is basically a, a plate that has that is in the plane outside of the board so these two plates need to be welded one option would be to just weld one side of this plate in a straight line 
and then come back again and weld the other side of the plate. However, what you may realize is that as soon as you are done welding the one side, the plate would bend completely and the entire structure would distort quite a bit. If you want to avoid that, the preferable option would be to first go in this way. So instead of doing the full weld, we split into smaller groups and let's say this each part is 100 millimeters. So do, we do a 100 millimeter, one, two, three, four and so on. So with each group, we are always balancing the thermal stresses in such a way so that distortion is not very high. And subsequently, we come back again and we fill up these spaces. So once we fill up these spaces, then the whole weld is one and we, we don't have to consider this as an intermittent weld anymore. Alternatively, instead of going one, two, right back to back, we can also go in a staggered fashion that is also acceptable and that is also very effective in controlling the distortions. So to summarize, we have discussed about various things of uh, welded connections of groove welds, um, uh, fillet welds and so on. <coughs> what are the major advantages of welding in comparison to other techniques of joining members? So first of all, holes are not required. When we provide welds, we unless we go for a plug weld type of a connection, uh, holes are not required. So when we provide a hole for a, for example, if we want to go for a riveted or bolted connection, we need to provide holes and those holes uh, cause a reduction in the cross section. But that is not the case here and that adds to an automatic economy of uh, structural sections. Also welding can provide us airtight connections, which is usually not possible in a bolted connection. Sometimes we, uh, in a bolted connection, if we want to develop an airtight connection, we have to use some kind of a gasket, etc. And their uh, maintenance and repair becomes a problem. However, in, ca in case of a welded joint, uh, more or less, most of the times we are able to get uh, airtight or watertight connections. And there are certain applications where this uh, ability becomes very, very critical. Also, welded connections can be used in versatile geometry. So, I'll, uh, to give you an example, if I wish to weld two tubular sections coming at a particular angle and meeting here. So, Doing this through welding is very easy. We just need to find that, find out that shape of that geometry and then we can simply weld it around this member. It is relatively easy. Okay. However, if it were to, if we were to bolt it, it would have been a huge challenge actually creating the exact profile of that surface and then bolting them together and making sure that there is sufficient strength available that becomes a huge challenge. So in such kind of a complicated geometries, welding is the obvious option, obvious choice. Also welded, welded connections by default are more rigid than bolted connections. Bolted connections usually allow some level of slip and even if we go for a, uh, uh, go for a um, uh, high strength friction grip bolts, those bolts also first of all they reduce the cross section area so automatically that uh, member itself becomes more flexible but in spite of that also when we do compare that with welded connections we see that they have almost no slip and there is a higher level of rigidity available in welded connections. Also, if we opt for a fillet weld, then the level of precision required in fabrication is relatively low. So for example, if you want to do a lap joint like this and uh, we are planning to do a fillet weld between these two plates. And because of some lack of precision, <coughs> our plates are, they were supposed to meet here, but exactly they don't meet here this plate actually ends up only being here. If that is the case, if it was a bolted connection, this would have completely disturbed the uh, disturbed the construction process because our holes would have misaligned. However, in case of welding, that is not a concern. We can, we need not, even if we were not able to come all the way to this point, even if we were able to come only to this point, as long as it is not disturbed the other considerations such as the lap length, etc., we can provide the weld here and that will be as effective as the weld here. What are some of the major shortcomings of welding again in comparison to other types of connections? Welding usually requires higher skill level in comparison to bolting. So bolting if it is not a high strength friction grip bolt, it is a very simple process almost a semi skilled person can do it. But welding is a very very specialized skill um, because of especially if you are talking about structural welding where the weld sizes are very large. <coughs> 
tech building you can see a lot of people can do outside on the streets also you can see several people can do it but they may not be certified to do a structural welding structural welding is a highly specialized skill and uh, there are special certifications required for those also a very regular a very detailed inspections are required after the welding process because uh, there is a very high likelihood of introducing any kind of a impurity or any kind of a distress point in a weld and that has to be investigated inspected uh, rigorously after every weld welding also becomes relatively difficult in certain uh, orientation so for example doing an overhead weld or doing a weld on a vertical flat surface or doing a weld on top of a very inaccessible area in comparison to bolting welding in such a situation becomes uh, more difficult because you have to carry all the cables etc whereas bolting all we need is a couple of bolts and a spur wrench welding also requires edges to be prepared especially if you are going for a groove welds so often groove welds are quite common especially in case of splicing etc and in such a situation we need to uh, spend a lot of time and uh, cost uh, on developing the edges which is basically removal of the uh, material and then again we have to fill that with the welding material again uh, as we just discussed uh, welded connections are susceptible to cracking uh, lamellar tearing and other types of uh, defects and that can affect the life of the structure also under fatigue conditions the welds typically are considered to be are found to be performing um, more poorly in comparison to uh, bolted connections so welds since they can uh, internally have a lot of sharp corners and those are the portions which introduce shear uh, stress concentrations and that is where cracks can start under cyclic conditions cyclic loading conditions so therefore under fatigue and, uh, and under cyclic conditions the welds are typically found to be less reliable and again, again also they can introduce distortions and in structures which uh, have to be prevented if they go beyond a certain limit so now we have gone through a brief summary of uh, uh, different advantages and disadvantages of uh, welded joints now we will move into some designing considerations for welded connections <coughs> so for understanding the designing we should also look at the material characteristics of the filler material that is typically used in welded connections so in case of uh, in case of uh, regular manual uh, spark welding we uh, use the electrode which is also the filler material and uh, the electrodes are classified with these symbols what you can see here is that ex40xx here basically 40 represents the strength um, and the ductility properties of this electrode material and the last two symbols this xx actually these will be replaced with some other symbols which would denote the other relevant characteristics which are not really so important for from a structural engineering point of view uh, such as in what position the welding can be done and what is the coating material thickness etc um, the welds uh, are available in various uh, the electrodes are available in various strengths is814 provides us some details of different strengths that are available so they are typically denoted by the ultimate strength of the material and the corresponding yield stress values are also specified in the same code the difference between 41 and say 43 is the level of ductility that is available between the two uh, between the two electrodes so this electrode is less ductile or otherwise it is not suitable to be used in impact conditions or where the loading could be of a very high strain rate and however when we opt for a uh, an electrode lower in this order such an such electrodes are capable of resisting impact loads up to minus 20 degrees centigrade temperatures that is they have higher uh, quite high impact and strength even at a very low temperature and they exhibit greater level of ductility also so this is a measure of ductility which is percentage elongation before the rupture and likewise we have higher strength electrodes also so the electrodes have to be uh, picked appropriately it is not only the electrode uh, strength that is relevant it is also Im important to pick the electrode dimensions because the length of the electrode of course uh, has some role to play but more significantly it is the diameter of the electrode 
uh, this is not really a responsibility of structural engineers usually the welders they themselves are qualified enough and they are supposed to pick the appropriate weld size sorry electrode size for a given weld size so if the weld structural engineer would mention a weld size of 8 mm then um, the welders have their own manuals they will need to refer to those manuals and then accordingly they pick for that given weld size what is the electrode diameter that they should go for because there is a direct correlation if the electrode diameter is larger you can do a larger weld size and also they need to pick the amount of current because that also has a strong role to play in deciding what size weld can be used uh, can be provided with which diameter electrode so they pick the electrode diameter and the power output and then they are able to do the required weld here this table specifically lists the different lengths which are available for a given diameter.